everyone. It's Kelly from the Antler Queens. And you are listening or watching the Antler Queens podcast, the most inclusive Yellow Jackets podcast, where we shove peace, love, and Yellow Jackets down your beautiful goddamn throats. Uh, so today, I am here with my awesome guest, Kelly McClure, whose work you're almost certainly familiar with if you're a Yellow Jackets fan who has ever read a single article about the show. Um, she's basically the source for Yellow Jackets journalism. She's Salon's Nights and Weekends editor. Her work has been featured in Vulture, the AV Club, Vanity Fair, Cosmopolitan, Nylon, Vice, where she became the first official music editor. Um, my personal favorite, Bust, where she also worked as a music editor, um, and elsewhere. Uh, in 2022, she started her own publishing imprint, Wolfie Vibes Publications, and released her debut novella, Something Is Always Happening Somewhere, in May of 2022. It's described as a visceral tale of grief with horror elements. She wrote an amazing article uh, titled Yellow Jackets is Gay as Hell, Why That's <laughs> Just What We Needed Right Now. Um, and that article is what inspired me to ask her to join me for this episode. Um we are going to talk about the evolution of female characters coming of age in the 90s, being gay in the 90s, and how much things have improved for female and lesbian characters since then. And we both went to high school in the 90s and remember it all. So I'm sure we'll be throwing lots of 90s nostalgia <laughs> at you. Um, so welcome, Kelly. Thank you so Thank much you. for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah. It's funny. I... Uh, it didn't occur to me. Well, it occurred to me, but we're both named Kelly. So when you introduced yourself, I waved like, that's me. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited to, to talk Yellow Jackets. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. Um, now, what? Uh, tell me a little bit about how you kind of um, fell into covering um, and, and writing about uh pop culture such as yellow jackets and music and tv yeah, yeah. um god well uh, writing it's pretty much the only thing i know how to do um it's the only thing that that i have ever had any serious interest in uh my family the majority of them um my mom my aunt my all my cousins they're all in the medical profession um i was like no i would like to be very poor um you know what i mean <laughs> i please no oh god no so um <laughs> from like high school on, uh, I was always interested in writing, always interested in television and movies and, and uh, you know, everything having to do with pop culture. So to answer your question more succinctly, I've been writing since I can remember, um, starting with the college paper and then um, in Chicago, which we, we both have, you know, ties to. We were just talking about that before we came on. Um, I wrote for the Chicago Reader. And I think that that was maybe my first big thing that, that got me going. Um, oh, I wrote wow. for the, I think it was called the Our Town section. Okay. Um, and would just go to like weird shows and, and, and not even so much music at that point, but like um, strange events and just slice of life stuff. Uh, and then from there, I would just pester people. Um, whatever, whatever publications I was a fan of, Bust was one of the ones early on. Um, I would just sort of like, in a very misty way, insert myself into <laughs> their uh, world. And then, you know, I work, I would work there all of a sudden. So that that's what worked for me. And that's what I did. Um, and so now I'm at Salon so many years later. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I was very eager every week to get my copy of the Chicago Reader when I lived in the city. Um, that's really awesome. I didn't realize that that you wrote for the reader how cool um and uh yeah super cool that you wrote for bust um now what uh, now now did you did you know ahead of time before you started watching it that you were going to be covering yellow jackets or did you start watching it first well when I first heard about it and I can't pinpoint I wish I could like the the first buzz you know um, about the show that I saw, I feel like it was on Deadline or, or Variety or however, you know, the breaking news about a show comes about. But I have never before seen a show that hit every button, like from the cast, the, um, you know, the early inklings of, of what the soundtrack would be, what the music would be, 
the the story itself um the the dual timelines it just everything was so interesting to me so i pitched vulture uh to see if they had anyone already you know signed up to do recaps and it was kind of interesting initially they weren't i don't want to say they weren't interested in covering the show but they were like Mm -hmm. let's wait and see so if you notice um when I first started doing the recaps for Vulture, we started, I think, with episode four, like three or mm-hmm. four. Because, um, you know, once they saw how good it was and, and you know, so many people were reacting so posit- positively to it, they were like, yeah, let's go ahead and do it. So we started in mid-season and then I ended up going back and, uh, you know, filling in, writing the first initial episodes. Uh, yeah, so that's how that started. But um to, to think that there was ever a time when they were like, we're not sure. And now, you know, the, everyone at Vulture is obsessed, not to, to say anything at all disparaging about Vulture, um, just with the new show, you, you aren't sure. You aren't sure, you know, what it's going to be like. And um, especially sometimes shows that are set in the 90s or have sort of a 90s aspect, it could have been cheesy. It could have mm-hmm. been and anything, you know, but for it to be as good, just undisputably good as it is, uh, that became very clear after just, you know, the first few minutes of the first episode. Yeah. Um, let me tell you that that first that image of the uh, which, you know, was in the very first scene in, of the show of the co-ed naked soccer <laughs> shirt. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, this is this is my home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah. I never had one of those shirts, but I remember them quite well. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, uh, now what, um, what aspects of, of the show just made you so compelled to watch it? Um, is it more like the nineties nostalgia? Is it, um, is it more just like the storyline itself of, of like the post rescue or the, the survival, the survivalism involved? Mm -hmm. What, uh, what do you find the most compelling? There's definitely layers to that answer because it's all compelling. Mm -hmm. Um, Juliette Lewis, Christina Ricci, Melanie Linsky, those are all like legit favorites of mine, like my people. Um, Anything that they're in, I will see. Um, They have my, you know, undying support. So that was the first like, oh, my God, this is going to be amazing. But then also just hearing more about the storyline. Um, one of my favorite books, which is a weird book to be your favorite book, but I love Lord of the Flies. I read Lord of the Flies, I think in junior high school, because I read that it was Corey Haim's favorite book, <laughs> which is so weird, because he was like my crush at the time, which is like even, you know, more funny now. But um, I was obsessed with Lord of the Flies and they, I had heard before they even announced the show that they were working on a female Lord of the Flies. And this didn't end up to be necessarily that, but obviously, you know, the um, the themes of the book were in mind when they created the show. So that was very interesting to me. Um, and then the dual timeline to see the lives of the teenage Yellow Jackets and then them, you know, so many years later, 20 years later, recovering from this severe trauma where you don't even really know. And this, I talked to you the other day about a theory that I had. Yes. My theory about the show, and I was thinking about this in the shower last night, and I was like that meme of the lady, you know, doing math in her head, like, huh. Um, <laughs> so when you're watching a show, you're, you're coming up with your theories and coming up with your ideas based on what you're shown, obviously, mm-hmm. right? Like we, the clues that we have are the clues that we're being given. So to me, this show can be viewed from one of two ways. We can view it as like a, a documentary or like a biography. You know, we're, we're watching what they're showing us, kind of taking it at like face value. Um, or we can watch it from sort of like a unreliable narrator aspect where what we're seeing are their memories of what happened. So that kind of skews things a little bit, because if I were to ask you to describe the most horrific thing that happened to you 20 years ago or last week, and you're describing it, you know, the the darkness would be a little bit darker. The if there was blood, the blood would be like, you know, redder, Mm -hmm. meaning that like 
they are remembering what happened in the wilderness. So that's not necessarily what happened. So like some of the aspects of the show where you're wondering like, is this the sort of like a mystical or, or otherworldly um, dynamic of it? Those are their skewed memories coming from a place of trauma. So like where Lottie, um, that scene, you know, prior to Rump Shaker being queued up, which is one of my favorite needle drops from the show. <laughs> she, I don't think personally that she charmed a bear and then killed it. I think that that bear was Javi. And with her remembering mm. these things, you know, it's like amplified in all of these characters' minds. And that is the kind of mystical element because it's through the lens of trauma. But anyway, that's what I was thinking of in the show. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, no, that's that's a really great point. And I'm, I'm kind of surprised that I didn't think of that before. Um, yeah, but no, you're absolutely right. I mean, our memories are not reliable when you're talking about something that happened that long ago it but especially when there's trauma involved mm -hmm. and there's other factors in at play too um i mean they were doing mushrooms they were starving they you know i mean i don't i've fortunately i've never been stranded in in the wilderness thinking that i was going to to die <laughs> but i would imagine that that clouds your perception of reality Somewhat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And another instance, so with um, Ty, it's really interesting to think like, what is going on with her? Like, what is, what is, what is happening? And all of her visions of wolves and the theme of wolves, because each of the characters kind of has like a, an animal patronus, if you will. There's always like the element of an animal. Um, someone's wearing a beaver pelt or someone's, you know, uh, associated with wolves. And in the case of Ty, where um, Van was, you know, supposedly attacked by wolves and then Ty comes to after a fugue state in the tree and she has on Van's necklace. I think that's because Ty actually attacked Van. Yeah, I you was... Know what I mean, so stuff like that, that's just like, the, it, their memories are making this this wild thing. And it could very well be. I mean, I've been wrong about theories before, but I think this is just them, like, remembering this in some wild way where really they were just out there feral on mushrooms you know starving probably having all manner of diseases and yeah. they're doing all of these things there there may be some sort of otherworldly element but i think this is just like the darkness of man that we're seeing the darkness of like these people suffering yeah yeah i i mean i um i definitely have had that thought about about Thaisa and van for sure um especially when she's, you know, she's so terrified the way she, the way she tells Simone that she's afraid she's going to hurt her. Yeah. Um, it's kind of terrifying. I mean, yeah. she just, it's, it's clear that it's serious. Um, and so, you know, that, that definitely kind of makes me, that played into me thinking that, that that was a possibility as well. Right. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, I'm really hoping that we'll get some more, insight into that in season two it looks like we're getting some post crash stuff which is kind of exciting yeah i can't wait um and actually speaking of um we had we had an exciting weekend mm -hmm. showtime released two teasers um we're still waiting on the full trailer so <laughs> like that's exciting but uh we did um i did a whole video kind of breaking down the screenshots from the first teaser trailer that came out but they released a second shorter one and um, I'm just going to show there were just a few new screenshots and I'm just going to bring those up. Um, so this first one is uh, Coach Ben and he is kind of um, he's leading the uh, the Yellow Jackets in a, in a buzz chant. Mm -hmm. um, and the here's. Natalie kind of, you know, trying to help him <laughs> pep everybody up. <laughs> I love her. Um, there's Thaisa getting out of somebody's vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, not sure who or where she is. Misty. Playing the bongos. <laughs> yes. I, I love this. And she's clearly in the same location where Natalie is. Right. And it's same interesting window. that they're wearing, that they're, 
both wearing shades of purple when we see them in these scenes. Mm -hmm. um, and then I love this. New, this is obviously Crystal. Um, <laughs> I love this new character. Every time we see her, she just looks like she's super enthused to be stranded in the wilderness. <laughs> and it's great. <laughs> A good pal for Misty then, in that sense. <laughs> yes, <laughs> for sure. Um, now, Kelly, before we get into our our main topic, I also wanted to um, to talk about, so you came out with a book recently, mm -hmm. and um, I'm actually going to pull up your website there, but um, you came up with a, uh, you came up with a, you came out with a book recently, and um it's called Something is Always Happening Somewhere. Uh, it was re You released it last year, right? Last spring? May. Yeah, last year. Okay. Um, yeah, why don't, you, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Is that something that you had, that you've been kind of talking about doing for a, a very long time? Yeah. Um, so I've always wanted to write a book. Um, the problem there is that I kind of live like a Winnie the Pooh lifestyle. Um, I'm, I'm very ambitious to, to a certain point, uh, but I am a Taurus. I like my leisure. So just always, it's one thing to want to write a book and it's another thing to, to actually write a book. They take a very long time. They take a lot of attention. So anyway, um, I'd been working up for years and years and years to, to writing a book. And the main problem also in addition to the Winnie the Pooh lifestyle is I have a background in totality in writing for the internet. And those are short pieces that, you know, maybe take a day or two at most an hour, you know, usually. So uh, to write something at this length and what I ended up writing was fairly short anyway, it's a novella, but that was kind of like the main exercise that I wanted to, to challenge myself to write something lengthy. Uh, so in doing that, I was like, well, now, you know, what am I going to write about? So I based this on, it's kind of hard to describe, but I, I went through a series of pretty big traumas in my own personal life. I lost um, my mother, my father, and my grandmother in sort of short uh, time span. Mm. So what this book is, is me trying to kind of leave the reader with the sort of, uh, grieving sadness that I had. I was going for a mood <laughs> and, and kind of almost like a, um, I was trying to get it out of me, you know? So the writing was uh, both a practice in, in, in writing something of length and of just getting this like deep, depressing sadness off of my chest and giving it to anyone who chances upon my book. <laughs> <laughs> oh so, yeah, that was that. And then the self-publishing thing was just my own impatience because um, with this being the first book I ever wrote, I knew that it was going to be kind of rough around the edges. So I didn't want to go through all the, the rigmarole of, you know, pitching and, and querying um, agents and stuff. I'm sure I'll do that, you know, down the line with more sincerity, but I wanted this just to be out. Once I finished writing it, um, I wanted it up and out there. So I created my own imprint. So it'd be a little bit, you know, easier to do that. And uh, in doing that, and I published this using Ingram Spark, which is something that any you know writer can use. It, it's it was very easy to do. Um, this book is available anywhere that a book would be. You know, you can get it on Amazon, you can get it at Barnes and Noble. So it was a fun exercise just to see what writing a book was like. And now I'm gonna do another one sometime. Hopefully not in another twenty years. <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> sooner. It'll take me you know shorter amount of time. Yeah. Well, it's it's definitely a lot easier to self-publish now than it was, you know, a couple of decades ago or back in the yeah. 90s when, yeah. when we were coming of age. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's that's, you know, there were so many great things about growing up in the 90s. Um, one of them is that there was no social media. So yeah. our worst mistakes weren't weren't there to haunt us for the rest of our lives. Um, but. At the same time, you know, it's it's a it was a lot tougher to kind of find success on your own. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's one thing that you know today's younger generation has that that I'm kind of jealous about. <laughs> yeah, but not um, having internet thing. I think about that sometimes, just in terms of like, how did we ever know when something was happening? 
like you you had asked me earlier like what you know how did you first hear about yellow jackets and jackets it's like oh deadline or, or you know variety how did we ever know what was going on how did we know when like a show was happening like a concert meaning show yeah. you couldn't describe that to people now you know like generation x how would you even describe what that was like like oh we we legit read newspapers or there was like a flyer on some random poll and that's you know whatever was on that flyer that's what we would end up doing that night <laughs> cuz that's what yeah. we saw yeah i mean i you know music has always been kind of the most important thing in my life and and going to um i mean going to shows i i had my my weekly ritual where when the reader would come out I, the first thing I'd go to is early warnings, yep, um, yep. which shows, which shows kind of the bigger shows that are, that are happening. Um, and then I would go through and find all of my favorite clubs, uh, lounge acts, double door, right. um, Metro, et cetera, and find out like who's playing when, you know, what, uh, what bands they're advertising. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now it's like, I can just look at my favorite bands on the internet and <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know what they're up to and, and even have conversations with them. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny, like it is much easier now to keep track of bands and to know what's going on, but it's also almost easier to miss stuff because there's so much. Like, yeah. I'll see stuff will come up on Facebook, which is just trash. Now the algorithm, it doesn't make any sense at all, but um, I'll see something from like a favorite band of mine. Cause I try to follow everyone I like. So I, I get those notifications, but I'll see something that's like happened a week ago or, you know, it's still so easy to miss stuff because there's kind of like an oversaturation at this point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Um, well, you know, it's, it's funny because it's, we're talking about, um, it's kind of the perfect segue because we're talking about, you know, what it's like to be a writer in today's world versus being in the nineties when you couldn't self-publish and, um, you know, that's a good segue into our topic, um, which uh, is basically just kind of comparing um, a lot of uh, female characters, female TV characters of the 90s, um, what that was like, the depiction of lesbian and gay characters in the 90s versus today. Um, there is, I mean, kind of an exciting statistic um back in last year i uh, glad reported that lesbians for the first time ever were making up the majority of lgbtq characters on broadcast on broadcast tv 40 percent wow. um and also lgbtq people of color um outweighed white lgbtq people for a fourth year in a row on broadcast tv which is like Amazing. Good. Really exciting. Yeah. Um, a whopping 92 characters, almost 12% of the 775 series, uh, reg ser I'm sorry, series regular characters scheduled to appear on broadcast scripted primetime television in the 2021 to 2022 season are LGBTQ. Um, 92 LGBTQ characters, almost 12%, um, mm -hmm. which is an increase of nearly 3% from last year. Um, that's not on my TV because my TV on my TV, the TV that I watch is probably closer to like 60 to 70%. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it represents a new record high percentage, um, in the history of the, where we are on TV report, according to glad. Wow. Uh, so that's, that's really fantastic. I mean, yeah. we're still not seeing nearly enough transgender characters, mm -hmm. but that's something that we're seeing now, um, finally is I mean you didn't see that in the 90s no no it just it didn't exist um and you know what I think about because we're about the same age we we mm -hmm. both went to high school in the 90s um what were some of your favorite tv shows back then my so-called life um R.I.P. too short lived um what else was mm -hmm. I watching in the 90s when did Buffy come out? That was around the 90s. That was, I think that was late, late 90s. 90s. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think of what I watched in like the early 90s. 
probably whatever trash my parents were watching, like The Simpsons <laughs> or Roseanne. You know what I mean? I watched yeah. a lot of MTV, 120 minutes. That, yeah. you know, I would tape those Daria, obviously. So now, yeah, now it's all coming back. Um, yes. The big one that I remember is my so-called life because I was obsessed with that show. My friends would come over after school and we would sit on my bed like like a meme, like a joke, like 90s kids sitting on a, a pink comforter watching on a tube television my so-called life. And then I would tape it so I could watch it over and over and over again. Um, Same. So when I think of 90s television, that's the first that I think of and Buffy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I would have to say um, the same thing. I mean, my so-called life was was probably my favorite show back then. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's and what's great is my so-called life and and Buffy both handled handled LGBTQ representation a little bit better than the other shows that were on at the time. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, and if you look at, so one of the earliest, just to, to, just to kind of do some comparisons here, um, going way, way back, um, one of the earliest portrayals of a lesbian character on film was in the 1915 German film, Different from the Others. Um, the character Frida is shown as a victim of society's homophobia and the film ends with her suicide. Oh God. Um, and typical. yeah, exa- exactly. I mean, that was the trip. That was the typical portrayal of lesbian characters um, yeah. for many years. Right. And on television and that that's on film in television. Um, and by the way, there's a great movie. I'm sure I'm sure you've seen the celluloid closet. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's great film. I, I recommend that everyone check it out if you kind of want to see like a, a great history of um of lgbtq representation um but uh you know as far as television goes i mean it was kind of unheard of for a lot of years um and in 19 1991 was the very first time that a lesbian kiss was shown on the small screen um and it was on la law which i did not watch but um that was the uh, the the first time, 1991, and you know, of course, the religious right was up in arms, right? Um, but it took more than two years for that to happen again on another show, um, and that was controversial because it was uh, in 1993 on Picket Fences, um, and uh, it was controversial because it was it involved teenagers, and mm-hmm. you know, everybody was was. So up in arms about that. Um, then there was another um, another same sex kiss on Roseanne, um, mm-hmm. where she, yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, nineteen ninety six. <laughs> if you catch ninety nine nineteen ninety six, um, you know one show that does not hold up well at all. Friends. Oh, God. Um, it's it's so funny because I was such a fan of it back when it was on. And it's like I try to watch the episodes now. And oh, my God, it was so intensely problematic. <laughs> yeah, it, it's so crazy. The other day, um, this is a totally different timeline. But um, my wife and I tried to rewatch Weeds because I remember when that show was on and I loved it. I loved everything about that show. It was unwatchable. Just every like, oh, my gosh so every episode so problematic like every single thing that you could think of which would be like absolutely not the thing to talk about now they were like this is hilarious right and we're like oh my god was it always like this oh man oh that's rough (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah I mean it's you know 1986 had um had friends where uh Ross's ex-wife um got married to a woman and um, you know, that was a a big, that was, that was kind of a big deal because there was still the issue that, you know, her parents weren't supportive, but they're as problematic as friends was. um, I like that they kind of treated them like a normal couple. Mm -hmm. Um, They, there weren't, I mean, there were, there were, there were a few kind of like problematic tropey jokes thrown in there, but, 
for the most part, I think they were pretty minimal. Mm-hmm. Um, and most of whenever Ross would talk about um, would talk about their relationship disparagingly, it was from the, the viewpoint of, you know, it's just my ex-wife versus, right. you know, and my ex-wife and this person that she's with now, not necessarily my ex-wife is, is a lesbian now and, and mm-hmm. that makes me bitter, you know? So it's, yeah. I, I appreciated, I, I did appreciate that. But, um, you know, the L word really kind of changed a lot. Definitely. That, that was the first big one. That in um, Queer as Folk. Mm-hmm those were like all right you know this is our time to shine i wish that the l word still would have gotten the reception as as queer as folk or any of the more male um you know centered shows but i guess that's just the way of the world but uh yeah when the l word came out it seemed unbelievable like a a whole show like a whole show wow that's crazy it's still crazy there hasn't been another one since (laughs) yeah there really hasn't yeah. Um, I mean, it's, you know, I watch, um, one of my favorite TV shows is, is Wentworth. I don't know if you've ever, have you ever seen Wentworth? I haven't. No. It's amazing. Um, it's one of my favorite shows of all time. I, straight characters on Wentworth are kind of hard to find. They're, it's, it's mostly, I mean, it's about a women's prison. Um, and most of their, uh, and you know, they have, um, they have a term that they use, gate gays, which, um, you know, basically refers to the uh, one of the main characters, Frankie, has a girlfriend in prison that she keeps referring to as a gate gay, um, meaning that she uh, she's probably going to go right back to her boyfriend when she right. leaves. But um, but for the most part, that's not even really a recurring theme very much. It's um, it's just most of. Most of the characters are women because it's a women's prison. Most mm-hmm. of the characters are not gate gays. They're they're women who have had lesbian relationships for most of their lives. Um, and it's so fantastic. It's um, because it's, you know, I admit I know about the L word because it was so groundbreaking. I didn't watch it just because it. I watched messed up stuff. That's what I watched. <laughs> And it just didn't seem like it was messed up enough for me, um, whereas Wentworth is. Yeah. But um, it's, you know, one thing that's so great about about the the rise of the evolution of lesbian characters on TV um, and female characters on TV in general, um, more lesbian relationships on TV mean more women. Mm-hmm. And... Right. Women are just, in my opinion, more compelling characters. Always. <laughs> um, and it's so great because it's, especially with a show like Wentworth, um, it's full of anti-heroes. There are no real pure good guys. Um, and but you're still rooting for these people. Mm-hmm. You're rooting for them a week after they try to kill your favorite character. Mm-hmm. Um, and their sexuality is not the relationships are are a big point in the show but their sexuality is not um is not this this big thing that's that's constantly shoved in your face in a way that's that's disrespectful to who they are Mm -hmm. um it's just embraced it's this is normal this is you know these are these characters are they have relationships with each other that are both platonic and romantic and sexual um and we're not going to make a big deal about it. We're just going to accept it. And it's it allows for so much, so many more compelling storylines. Um, because the truth is that marginalized characters in general, um, especially with women, I mean, just we have more demands put on us. We have more expectations. We're constantly fighting different demons than, Mm -hmm. than our, our, our white male counterparts. Um, You know, how can that not create more compelling storylines? I always wonder that Um, there's, you know, every year there'll be some sort of argument um, surrounding a movie that comes out where 
you know, the, the main hero is a woman like Wonder Woman or, um, you know, the cancellation of the Batgirl movie, God forbid, you know, bring up the, the Ghostbusters that had Kristen Wiig and everybody, which I thought was amazing. Men like to come out and say, like, this is something that's for men and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it should have a, a male cast. And I have a controversial reaction to that when I hear things like that. Where, you know, where I come from, my, my circle of friends and my upbringing, men who only like to watch other men are gay. <laughs> like, you know, if, you're, if you are a man and you hate the thought of watching a movie, you know, with a female cast, you're probably gay. So, that, so that's saying something. I mean, you know, I'm joking, but what a ridiculous thing that you can't appreciate a film that has, you know, a broad cast of like everybody, like you would see just walking out the front door of your house. Like, why mm -hmm. would you only want to see yourself reflected back at you? What a boring existence. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, did you, uh, did you watch Sex in the City at all when it was on? I have dabbled. Um, it, it, that's one of those shows that people talk about so much that you feel like you have to watch. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't ever really get into it. Because that's, that's, you know, you, there, I watch The Real Housewives, so it's ridiculous, because I love, <laughs> I love The Real Housewives, but there's something about Sex in the City, the scripted aspect of it, that never really, it wasn't that compelling to me, but I've seen enough episodes that I know what it's all about. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's funny, because I watched it, because it was on, on Sunday nights, um, around the same time that The Sopranos and Six Feet Under were on, and I watched both of those. Um, that's the only reason I watched it because it was short, it was a half an hour and I had nothing else to do during that time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, but I never got into it and it's, it was actually, I mean, it was a small improvement in the sense that it was a show that were all, all of the main characters were female. Mm-hmm but we're still fairly one dimensional. Right. Um, and it seems like it hasn't been that long that television shows have started feeling comfortable with women being anti-heroes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which is really exciting. If you look at yellow jackets, I mean, that's all it is. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There are yeah. no true heroes. No. And, and, and that is, Another thing that I just love seeing reflected back, the salty and the sweet of life. That's, no one ever has like a, a perfect, except for maybe Laura Lee. <laughs> she is a sunny day every day. But yes. um, we all have inner demons. We all have a darkness within us, you know, that we struggle with. And everyone in a public setting, you want to seem like you have, you know, no problems, but that's not realistic. So for this cast, just the various ways that they handle a shared trauma, because they all went through the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we still don't know exactly what that is. Like, because again, going back to my theory, we're being shown these things, but what really happened? And they even ask themselves that and other people ask them that. What really happened out there? That's a, a reoccurring line. And I think that's kind of a nudge to the viewer to question that ourselves, like we're being shown this, but what really happened? But anyway, so they, they all went through something and how they're reacting to it is so real because I think that's how it would be. Like in the instance of Shauna specifically, she comes to mind because there's several scenes of her crying in the shower and then going out and making dinner for her family. If, if something horrible happens to you, you still have to get up the next day and feed your dog. You still have mm -hmm. to get up the next day and put pants on and, and live, even though, you know, the worst thing that you could possibly imagine just happened to you. And that's very much reflected in this show. And it, it seems so crazy. Like, you know, how can they even function in society if they ate people, which we haven't seen yet, um, but it's coming. Uh, you know, they've, they've harmed each other and just all these different things, but they're still thriving to some degree in life. It's fascinating. And all the, the places that that can go throughout the, the upcoming seasons, I can't wait to see how those characters develop. Yeah. You know, it's, um, 
I remember a long time ago, I'm a big horror film, movie film fan, fanatic. I mean, yeah. it's that's pretty much, I watch horror films and documentaries and that's about it. Same. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I remember, that I'm switching gears here a little bit, but it all, it all goes together, I promise. Um, I remember reading an article several years ago about, it was in the early years of, of reality television. And it was, um, the article featured a quote from a, uh, a female reality television star who said that she got fired from her job um, because it was too distracting. Her notoriety was too, had become too distracting mm -hmm. for her employer. And she couldn't even find work anywhere um, because she just, nobody wanted to hire her because she just, everybody knew who she was. Mm -hmm. And so and it wasn't even that she did anything terrible on television or anything. It was just the attention that I brought. Right. Um, and when I read that, it made me think about the horror films that I watched a lot differently. And, you know, I, I, I think about some movies like Texas Chainsaw Massacre mm -hmm. um, or, or several others like it. I mean, you see, you know, at the end, you see this, this, this final girl character get away mm -hmm. and that's it. And yeah. It just ends. And, and then what then? So she just goes to like 7 Eleven or something and gets like some taquitos. Like, what? I'm also fascinated about that. And it's so funny you bring that up because what then? Yeah. How do, you, how do you recover? How does anyone recover from? And usually they're like smiling too with like a sense of relief. Like, yeah, it would be, you know, relieving, but I would be, I would have to go into the hospital for some extent of time, I think, and just sit yeah. and think about what happened. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, and it's not even, and and it's not even the um, initial aftermath that's necessarily that interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. the the shaking and crying and and not being able to sleep. And what's really fascinating to me is to think about that person like five, ten, twenty years down the line, and how is it still affecting them? Right. How are they able to? Do they have a family? Do they have a job? How is that affecting them then? Um. You know, just to give it, just to give a personal example, I'm somebody who now I'm I'm legally I'm legally disabled for um, for physical reasons, mm -hmm. but just an interesting tidbit ab about me because of extensive trauma that I've gone through. Um, when I was working full time, I actually required an office or a space away from everybody else where I could um, where I could see people approaching me. Because if somebody even came up to my desk a little bit too quietly, if I was working in a cubicle, I would scream like a goat. Okay. <laughs> and it was, and I really do scream like a goat. I sound like a goat when I when I'm startled. And um, you know, it's it's like okay. And I never really thought about it like it was weird, even though it even though I knew it was weird. Mm -hmm. Um. I never really thought about, you know, gee, that would be interesting to see characters dealing with stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, you know, is, is Thaisa going to be giving a speech and so uh, one of like one of her, her handlers or whoever comes up to her a little too, a little too softly and quietly and she slugs him in the face like out of reflex you know yeah with a letter opener she's just like that one scene where she's so dexterous with the letter opener and her yes. eyes turn red <laughs> yeah yeah yes like that's the kind of stuff that I want to see and I don't feel like I've ever really seen that anywhere before no definitely not and yellow jackets yellow jackets gave that to me finally <laughs> yeah I love um, just thinking about the different characters and, and how they are, you know, dealing with what happened. Um, so my favorite character from the show is Misty. Um, okay. Just like my favorite character from the L Word was uh, Jenny. I, I tend to go for the, not not even an underdog. I don't know. They just appeal to me, these, these characters. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see Misty have quote unquote friends. So in season two, you know, we've got Elijah Wood and uh, is it, is it Crystal who's going to be her, her friend? Yes. She's being brought on because I don't think that Misty can do that. 
Um, and in the, the teaser trailer, that scene where she's like, you know, don't cry, babies cry. And then she does sort of like what in her mind a person crying would look and sound like. Mm-hmm. I feel like she's masking 100% like through through her life. Like we don't know yet what if she has any type of real diagnosis or um, what her full deal is yet. But going into season two when she's going to have a fellow citizen detective and, you know, she's going to have friends. And obviously, I'm sure a lot of the season is going to center on um, everyone going to try to find Natalie. So she's going to be working in this team environment. Um, But flashback to season one when she was stranded in the wilderness with you know most of these girls with shauna and ty who she's going to be in cahoots with in season two if she didn't bond with these people in a year and a half which she obviously didn't because no one wanted to have anything to do with her you know they had that her on the do not answer uh yeah uh in their phones and stuff if she didn't bond with them after a year and a half in the wilderness she's not going to develop this types of relationships with them now that she would like to but I don't even think she really would like to I think she wants to want to so just I want to see her mask crack a little bit and see the real Misty come out and what's really underneath all of that uh shaky poise because that's how I see her like she's very poised you know she can do a lot of things she's she's extremely accomplished she's a nurse she can help out in situations she can keep her cool and and what keeping her cool looks like for a person like Misty but Mm -hmm. um when she comes up uh against adult Lottie you know we see her in the purple we see her playing the bongo so obviously she's getting sucked into the culty aspect you know whatever that's going to look like is she doing that as sort of like a mole? Like she's investigating the cult or does she actually get, does she like buy it? You know, does she drink the Kool-Aid or does she still have her misty ulterior motive? Like we saw her with Jessica. I think she will. I think that Misty takes what she brings. Like no one's ever really going to get anything over her, but, um, I think there's going to come a point where, like I said, that mask cracks and we get to see her trauma in a way that she tries desperately to, to keep inside. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, it's I did an entire like, as I mentioned earlier, I did an entire episode just breaking down all the screenshots. And mm-hmm. we, of course, brought up that the scene where she's crying and um, it's, you know, I'm just I'm so focused on what is she crying about? Um, that I didn't even like really stop to think about, you know, oh, this is her cracking a little bit. This yeah. is her kind of, you know, losing control a little bit. We're going to clearly get to know more about her mm-hmm. um, on a deeper level. So that's, that's exciting because she's, she's very compelling. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, she and she and Ty- Misty and Thaisa are my two favorite mysteries of the show because mm-hmm. And they're, they're both mysterious in completely different ways. Yeah, definitely. Um, And don't want anything to do with each other. Yeah, exactly. But they (laughs) will in season two because Thaisa was, um, it was like, so it was Thaisa, Shauna and Natalie, but Natalie is going to be out of the picture for a little while. So I'm assuming that Misty is going to take her place and helping everyone, you know, look for her. If that's in fact what happens, which, you know, I imagine it would, that's, that's Mm -hmm. where we're going to start out. So just to see Thaisa, you know, being the character that you just described, working hand in hand with Misty, what a basket of snakes, like what a, what a combination of characters to see those two doing anything, you know, going grocery shopping or anything that's going to be like really something to watch. (laughs) And there's the, uh, the big pink elephant in the room between them, which is Jessica. Right, right. Yes. Um, You know, I mean, it's that's going to be a fun one to see unravel. Um, and what happened with Jessica? So, so Misty poisons her cigarettes. She smokes the cigarettes and dies. And then that car is just there. <laughs> like who came? Yeah. Cause it wasn't far from Misty's house. So is she right. going to go out then and be like, Oh my God, what happened? You know, I could just see her trying to act like, Oh my God, what a mess. Like, do you want some tea or something? <laughs> you know, talking to the, like the responding police. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to to see for sure. Um, it's I don't know how they're going to explain that one. Um, obviously, Tyson and Misty are going to have to have a conversation about it. I can't imagine yeah. that that's going to be avoided right. somehow. Um, and you know, did did Misty already know that? I mean, obviously, Jessica told Misty that Tyson had hired her, but. Did she know beforehand? You know, it's there's so much that we're not privy to that. Yeah, I think I'm there's excited. a lot in Misty's files that we don't know about yet. Um, I think it can, and even like looking, like I said, I, I rewatched all of the first season yesterday for the eighth time, like, you know, someone with a serious problem. But um, the way in which Misty ties in to everything is really interesting. Like she's definitely being set up to be like a key figure in ways that I don't even think we've seen play out yet. Yeah. Um, going back to like, I think it's the pilot episode where they're having, yeah, it is the pilot episode where they're having their bonfire, the yellow jackets and everybody else. They're having their bonfire in the woods the day before they leave for nationals. And Natalie um, takes acid and she's looking and she just sees a flash of Misty in the woods Misty mm-hmm. wasn't at the party, but she's just like, Misty, like something is up with Misty in specific that's going to really come into fruition. Maybe, you know, if not this season next, because I know that they're kind of trying to draw things out, like the cannibalism I read. We may not even see this season because they're trying to work it up to where they like, how would I even say that like they earn having to be cannibals. Rather than yeah. just like, oh, we're randomly going to eat our friends one day. Like, they're going to have to get to such a place of, like, desperation that they're not quite in yet to get to the yeah. cannibalism. But, yeah, just the way that the show pe- feeds out and piecemeals the information, it's masterful. You know, from the marketing to that, it's just, like, God, honestly, the best show. Yeah, it it absolutely is. And um, and I love that. I love that it's doing as well as it is with a – um. You know, with with an almost entirely female cast. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's another show that just has such great sapphic energy. Mm-hmm. Um and it's I loved what it what did you think of I I thought it was so great. What did you think of the uh of Van and Thais's coming out moment? I loved it. It was so cute. Yeah. And it was so I the thing that um, I wrote for the AV Club, which you you mentioned and we talked about when, when we first started talking to one another, um, it's amazing to me. Well, I'll, I'll talk about Shauna and Jackie first. Just the fact that a lot of people didn't pick up on what was so clearly, you know, a, a romantic vibe between yeah. them. And then um, with I picked Mary, that up from the uh, the way they looked at each other during the, the pepper rally. Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. Yeah. And just sitting in the car and like, you know. Girlfriends mm-hmm. are kind of like that anyway. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are like, but still, that was that's pretty obvious. But um, I mentioned in that article that in the '90s, e- it wasn't easy to be open, right? You know, at, at all. Like you, there were gay people everywhere. You know, I came out with my friends and stuff when I was 14, but that was rare. Um, most of the time, like you, you would do it, you would live your life, but it was very much something private and, you know, close to the chest and only your, your closest circle of friends knew. So Van and Ty, for them to like, try to keep their relationship secret, that tracks with the timeline. They, they absolutely Mm would have, would have done that, but it was so sweet to see them finally being like, well, we can't hide this for much longer. You know, we're living in in the dirt in such close proximity with everyone else. They're going to find out, you know, sooner or later, so just walking in casually rather than being like, we're gay. <laughs> like, they yeah. just walked into the party holding hands and everyone was like, duh. Like, yeah, you know, we already knew. It was so sweet and so on point with how you would want people to respond to something like that. Yeah, that that's how I, that's exactly how I remember it too. I mean, I had, I had friends, um, I had friends back when I was in high school, like everybody knew that, everybody knew that they that they were probably gay and in the closet Mm -hmm. um but they didn't come out really until um you know until like the year or two after they graduated Mm -hmm. and everyone was like okay yeah cool big deal glad you came out (laughs) glad you could be who you are you know it just it was 
that that was very accurate for that time. It's like mm-hmm. people still felt like they needed to hide it. Yeah. But um, but people were starting to um to be much more accepting to where when when people would come out to their friends, it was just like, you know, everyone was happy for them. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it was, it was a very nice moment and it kind of took me back to high school a bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. It was cute. Um, you know, I love that I uh, getting back to just the evolution of, of queer characters on TV. Um, you know, I'm thinking about how, Back in the 90s, late 90s, early aughts, a lot of TV shows would do something where like Sweet Sweet comes along and they have two female characters kissing. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And either it was just um, somebody was drunk at a party or it turns into this toxic relationship and Mm -hmm. one of them realizes that, you know, they they were always into men. Um, you know, it was, it was such a, like, it was, it was just such a costumed kind of trope. Yes. Um, and I love that in Yellow Jackets, we have a character like Taisa who, um, I mean, first Taisa and Van, you know, it's the way they come out is very nat to everybody is very natural. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you look at Taisa in the present day storyline, um, you know, she even addresses to, I love that she's addressing to um, Diane Raffelsberger that how inspired she is that somebody like her son can, can have two moms and, and be like, this is normal. This is, you know, and, and nobody, and when he's at the playground, you know, they're the kid that he punched is making fun of him because his mom is, uh, you know, his mom is a, a cannonball. (laughs) You know, they're, they're not, uh, they're not pushing the angle that they may have pushed in earlier decades, which is, you know, this is, you can't be a politician. You can't run for office if you're gay, because look at what's going to happen. Look at all the stuff that's going to happen because of it. Right. Um, You know, the, the attack ads against her are, um, you know, she's eating ribs really (laughs) sloppily and, you know, they're, they're implying cannibalism. Yeah. You know, there are so many kind of offensive, tropey ways that they could have gone with that. And I love that they didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. And even considering that, like, the cast, trying to think, well, Jasmine and um, Liv are queer from the Mm -hmm. queer community. And Melanie Linsky is is all but. (laughs) I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to speak to her directly or, you know, or, or, or like out anyone, but she, she's very much, you know, within the, the LGBTQ community. But other than that, it's not like there is a, an actor on set saying like, you know, being a sensitivity reader to all these things. It's just kind of like everyone inherently gets it. They're just cool. Like the creators of the show, um, Barton Ashley and, and just like the cast, they're on point with how these things should be just organically. Like there is like a gay vibe to this whole show. Like there's, mm-hmm. so, you know, Coach Ben, everybody, but it's not a thing. It's not like the, cent- like, oh my God, there's gay people on this show. It's just like, not even about that. That's just how they are. And even the cannibalism is kind of downplayed. Like this is a show that's tiptoeing, hinting around, you know, these people eating their friends or God knows who out there in the dirt but that's not even being overblown. It's just like the perfect amount of real life, not even innuendo. It, they're just laying it out there how it is and they're not making it some like kooky, embarrassing thing, which is, again, just so masterful and speaks to the writing and the casting and everything. Yeah. And, and you know, how nice that you have characters like Jackie and Shauna, um, you have relationships like that where it's not spelled out for you. You know, Mm -hmm. it's not Yeah, Jackie has a boyfriend that Shauna slept with, but there's still that very, very heavily implied kind of deeper connection with them. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And it's not, they, they don't have to, they don't have to spell it out. They don't, um, you know, it's just, they can have these two characters who maybe have 
crushes on each other are mm-hmm. are romantic romantically and sexually attracted to each other but don't talk about it you know mm-hmm. um i'm guessing they probably never did address it yeah um and i love that they can that a show can do that and just leave the fandom to to ship these two characters and people can say well no Jackie and Shauna were straight well how do you know yeah <laughs> and and i saw there was a lot of not really backlash but people bringing up the sort of like queer coding and queer reading between you know with the dealing of the characters of, of Shauna and Jackie but that's only if you want to like be that way and, and, and see it through some like negative connotation, because I think that it was very clear. There are friendships. I have had friendships like this where yeah. you are in a sense in love with that person more so than a friend, you know, mm-hmm. you're, you're a, like teenage girl friendships are obsessive. Yeah. That's my favorite part of relationship as a whole. I like that when you're like, you just want to, you know, absorb a person. So seeing them, seeing Sean and Jackie sitting in the car and sort of like holding their glances for a little bit too long and, um, you know, exchanging the necklace and stuff, um, that could just be a really intense friendship. But you can feel, you know, someone who is gay, when, when I see that, I'm like, this is intense. Like these people, there's a love there that maybe they don't even, like you said, they don't even have a name for, they haven't come to terms with and they never will because, you know, Jackie's dead. But uh, I wonder if we'll get to see more of that, like more instances in flashbacks or whatever. I don't think there will be Jackie flashbacks in season two, but it would have been cool to see that drawn out a little bit more like during a sleepover or something, if there was any sort of like, Oh, I want to, you know, roll over. And, you know, I know if I roll over, we'll probably kiss, but I'm just never going to roll over more of that tension, which was just very tangible between the characters, I think all the way through. And even with Shauna sleeping with Jeff, that's another thing that like a little bit more toxic, but I, I know situations I've been in situations where you can't have the person that you want. Yes. So you sleep with the closest thing to them. So by Shauna sleeping with Jeff, she could kind of, feel as though she was sleeping with Jackie. And especially in that scene where she tells Jeff, you know, say, say that you love me. I won't hold you to it. In her mind, she was probably thinking that that was Jackie. Yes. That's exactly how I took that. So yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. <laughs> um, You know, it's the other thing is when Jackie is, when Jackie's reading uh, Shauna's journal mm-hmm. and she's crying, um, I didn't necessarily take that as her crying that her friend slept with her boyfriend. Yeah. Um, I I took it more as she felt like Shauna should have saved herself for her. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of how I took it. Yeah. I just got goosebumps. (laughs) Yeah. That's so sweet. And I I definitely can see that. And with Shauna's journals, I'm glad you brought those up because I think when she – adult Shauna when she goes into her safe and gets out those journals and sits on the floor and has her like moments with them. I think that what is written down in those journals is what's really, what really happened. Mm -hmm. So she goes back to those journals to kind of center herself and remind herself like, you know, things are going crazy right now. And my head is filled with all of these like dark remembrances of what happened in the wilderness. But now in my journals, I see that this is what really happened. And there probably is stuff in there, you know, about Jackie, her admitting the feelings that she had or, or what have you. So when Jackie read those journals, I'm sure that there was a lot in there, that that was a really heavy moment, you know, for, bo- for both of them. Yeah, it's, it's so great that, that we can have something like that now. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas before, it's like just, they had a, a TV shows just really laid on the tropes so heavily um and i just i love this that i it's so nice to see queer relationships treated with um the same the same type of ambiguity Mm -hmm. as as hetero relationships it's just it's it's really refreshing um you know it allows for it allows for a more exciting and positive fandom because you don't you have you have a greater um, a greater understanding of 
of same sex ships, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, they're not, they're not, they don't have the same negative light cast on them because, um, you know, this, this couple is, uh, an opposite sex couple and that means they're absolutely hetero. And so you can't ship them with, with characters of, of the same sex. It's, I, I don't know that I've ever quite seen anything like that in another fandom as I do with Yellow Jackets. And it's, it's so great to see. Um, It is it's there's so much fighting when it comes to labeling ships as, as problematic. And um, it's just, I haven't seen any of that Mm-mm. in yellow jackets. And it's like, you can ship Shauna with, with Jeff and Adam and Jackie and Taisa and it's all good. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and like you say, the subtle way that they do it is really beautiful because, you know, again, just thinking of the timeline when they were in the wilderness, 19 months, so they're if they wanted to really make it like ridiculous, they would have literally been sleeping with everyone. Everyone would have been sleeping with everyone because I went yeah. to drama club once. In oh, yeah. And we were there. <laughs> we went to um, Big Bear because I went to high school in California. So we went to Big Bear for drama club. We were there, I think, for for two nights and three days. Literally everyone slept with everyone. Like it, was, it was a, a mass orgy. So that's what happens, you know, and we were, we bonded for life. Like I'll never forget any of those people's names, but if they wanted to really make this ridiculous, they could have, but they didn't, they just made it, you know, subtle so far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, it's, you said, you said drama club and I just, I'm like, oh yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. I was a drama kid and that's just how, that's just how things were. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It was it was just a big incestuous orgy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, let me ask you, what has been your favorite storyline um, so far in Yellow Jackets? Definitely Misty. Uh, I I like her so much. She's she eats up every scene that she's in. Um. I think that she's just so dynamic to watch. She's hilarious and dark, deeply yeah. dark. I remember. I don't know. E News does a lot of the like first first view and you know first interview from the show so far so it must have been there but I read something where they were talking about the table read for the pilot and how when Misty got to the part where she um that scene uh in the hospital because you know she comes in at the very end Mm -hmm. of the pilot so when she's in there and she's like what is the that patient's name um Mrs. DiGennaro DiGennaro yeah where she's like oh my god did you have an accident you know that that whole thing and then um, when she leans into the patient's face and is like, you know, don't fuck with me. That when she read that part through the read through, everyone was horrified to <laughs> see her click into that role. And because they didn't know initially how she was going to play it, how she was going to play the character Misty. So her reading of that line and her inhabiting that subtle just flip of the switch to darkness, they were like, oh, yeah, this is going to be intense. So I, I love seeing her go dark like that, but I yeah. also love to see her vulnerable, but it's a vulnerable, like I said before, that I don't entirely trust. I don't know if we're supposed to trust. I think her light moments are actually more terrifying than her dark moments because those are the times when I think she's masking where she's trying to be like, I'm here with cronuts, you know, I'm here um, with my like kooky bird and I'm just trying to live a life, but she's doing that with intention she's doing that because she wants to blend in she wants information there's it's always some sort of exchange for her i think um but yeah she's that's definitely her storyline is is my favorite i love you bring up masking and and i just love how all four of these characters um constantly have a mask on but they're such different masks Mm -hmm. um for taisa it's about you know being in control she's a a leader and she's she has everything under control but she she really does it and you see her fall apart and Mm -hmm. lose control um with shauna it's shauna is not one to fuck with (laughs) but she like she kind of masks by just leading this this example of like this meek housewife who Mm -hmm. just um you know she she goes to book club. Well, she doesn't go to book club, but you know, she she kind of just has this persona where she just tries to blend in as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And whereas Natalie is is like she has this this very kind of her masking is more has more to do, I think, with her uh, with her self sabotaging, and right. she's got this really genuine heart, and she's kind of the moral compass of the show in a way. Um, but you know, she comes off as just very edgy and um, you know, and, and has a wall around her and doesn't, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we see that with, with Kevin, especially because mm-hmm. she like, she keeps kind of, she's just really dismissive of him. Mm-hmm. Um, but then after he storms out of her motel room, um, you know, we see her in a later scene sniffing his pillow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. uh, they just they all mask in such different ways and it's all because of their their trauma and um and how it affected them individually and I love that yeah that scene all the scenes of Natalie when she was living in that hotel um were so heartbreaking like the the Mazzy Star scene yes where that's oh my god I I think that's the the scene out of the whole series that I've watched the most because I would just rewind that over and over because it was so beautifully written and just the pacing of that was fantastic and the song choice but Mm -hmm. um with her and Kevin I think that well well, I think she was trying to leverage him for information first but then obviously that was that was her best friend in high school and she missed him and having that moment of closeness I think that in some way all of these characters they feel so like dirty on the inside they're holding such secrets that they just simply feel like they don't deserve that happiness Mm-hmm. So when Kevin left, she was like, well, you know, maybe for the rest of my life, I can only ever have these tastes of. And I think that, you know, promiscuity speaks to that a lot. Like you want connection, you want this love, but you don't feel like you can keep it. You right. don't feel like you're worthy of having that to any like, you know, length of time. So that's so sad. And I've read too about season two that um, Juliet Lewis has says has said that her character Natalie is going to be completely different in in the second season. So I'm wondering, like, is that going to come about via Lottie's influence, or if she just puts on a different mask? Like, what is that difference going to look like? Yeah, it's I I really like the line from the teaser that was released where uh, Lottie tells her to asks her to tell her what she sees and she mm-hmm. says the darkness we brought it back with us yeah that's super fascinating so yeah. i'm i'm eager to find out what she um because she seems to have just kind of like not she seems to try to not let it what all of that stuff affect her very much mm-hmm. in the present day yeah um but you know almost like she just kind of wants to forget but she is you know it seems like she might be kind of embracing that and acknowledging it and confronting it a bit more yeah and she's she's actually the only one I think that this is correct I'm pretty sure she's the only one who's done sort of like a jokey throwback to what happened to them in the wilderness when um (gasps) she and Misty are driving to see Kevin and Misty has the beef jerky and she's like beef jerky Misty really that was hilarious because it's like I would joke about it. Like if I did like some can bullshit in the past, I would, <laughs> I would joke about that because I feel like I would have to, I always make light of like the worst possible things that have happened to me, but she did that in that scene. And I don't recall a time when any of the others have joked about it or even really made flippant mention, you know, of, of what happened to them. Yeah. Yeah. I don't either. Um, so that's going to be really exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, let me ask you this. Do you think that uh, do you think that there is possibly any um, I know a lot of people ship them, mm-hmm. but do you think that there is is possibly something more or was something more at one point between Shauna and Taisa? Yeah, definitely. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Same. yeah. Same. There yeah. was something about the way that she that she grabbed her hand when she was in the diner. Yeah. And then just dropped it right away. And she was the first one she called. She went yeah. and got her little flip phone and it was like, no introduction, no anything. And I don't think your name would come up on a flip phone. So she was just like, we need to talk. And Taisa mm-hmm. just automatically knew who was on the other line. So it seems yeah. like they, they have a, a thicker thread than, than the others, definitely. 
Yeah. I I actually it's funny. I I actually I actually ship Taisa with I think pretty much everybody on the show. Yeah. <laughs> Taisa and Natalie are my favorite characters. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, I, she's such a great partner. <laughs> she's just like her relationship. She has the best relationships on the show. She has the most yeah. solid relationships. Yeah. Um, It'll and, be uh, interesting. I, I don't want to cut you off. I, um, I just getting so excited more and more thinking about what's to come in the second season. So in the teaser trailer, I think it was, or maybe the new one, there's Ty standing in front of like an open door. Um, and I'm assuming that that's Van. I'm assuming assuming that they're setting her up. You know, they're going to have that first face-to-face that we'll be seeing. We don't know if they've had any connection, you know, that, that we haven't been privy to till now. But what is that going to be like? Because Ty, obviously, it seems like she's going to be splitting from her wife. Mm-hmm. Um, so is she going to get back together with Van, yeah, or we'll does, you know, does Van have another partner or something? That's going to be something. something. Very interesting. Yeah. I love Lauren Ambrose, so, so I'm so excited about this. Yeah. I've been watching Servant. I just watched the the first episode of the new season. Um, she can be scary. She can yeah. be. She does this thing that I love in actresses where they're sad and terrifying at the same time. And I feel mm-hmm. like the, that's like kind of Yellow Jackets. That's how you could describe the show. And that's what a lot of the, the cast does. But Lauren Ambrose, my God, she can really do that well. Yeah. Have you ever heard her sing? No. Who are all these she... people that are singing? I just saw that Megan Fahey from uh, White Lotus. I didn't know that she had a Broadway background. I have gaps oh. in my, my cultural knowledge. So okay. I, I was watching YouTubes of her singing. And now I guess everyone has this secret singing past that I don't know about. Lauren Ambrose can sing her butt off. Oh um, she was, uh, I can't remember what song she sang in Six Feet Under. I think it was like, they did a lot of kind of hilarious fantasies, like dream sequence type things on the show. Mm-hmm. And um, like there was one great thing where she was, she was uh, doing a dance audition and she was dancing to, um, I think, flash dance and <gasps> she broke her legs off and it was, <laughs> they do they do all kinds of funny like dream sequence type type things on there but she sang some song i can't remember what and i had assumed that they dubbed in somebody else's voice mm-hmm. um and it was her and i was just blown away when i found oh out God. because her voice is phenomenal so i have this i had this headcanon that van jokingly auditioned for cats <laughs> and ended up making it because she <laughs> She was so good. I would love that. Misty would love that. <laughs> yes, Misty would love that. I can't see Van actually being in Cats, but it would be yeah. kind of funny. Oh my god! <laughs> it looks like um, she runs like a comic book store or some type of like '90s ephemera store yeah. based on that one shot. What yeah. is it going to be? What's going to happen? I don't know. Um. Let me ask you, what is your, what's your favorite piece of 90s nostalgia from, from the show? The sassy magazines, just like casually yes. strewn about. Um, what else? The caboodles. So many of the like chunky high tops that they wear. Mm-hmm. The hairstyles. There's a lot of like high pony shots. Yeah. Um, it, definitely all of the music. And them getting ready with their little spritz. You know, it was probably like... Um, the vanilla from Bath and Body or um, <laughs> Love's Baby Soft or something. I wanted to see, I would like to go through like their stuff and see what they actually had, but they really got it. It feels very 90s. The 90s timeline, the cars, oh my God. Yes. I love yeah, it. the Sassy Magazines got me. Yeah. I, I loved that. That was fantastic. Yeah. Um, and the light right light. And in, in yes. room that just said "fuck you," that I would totally do something like that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, completely. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jackie had, had Jackie had a bottle of Dream from the Gap on her dresser. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> um, it was yeah, the Coed Naked T-shirt. Yeah, the Coed Naked soccer T-shirt was pretty fantastic. Yeah, and the the pink um, Converse too. They just really did it so good. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. There was a shirt that Shauna wore in one scene 
in the 90s timeline. It was like this striped shirt and she's wearing it when she finds Javi um, Mm -hmm. going through her stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was talking with somebody else about about that shirt that she was wearing and we're like, yeah, I think I think all of us had that shirt and I'm pretty sure we got it from um, American Eagle. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Or Arrow Postal. One of those two. (laughs) <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I was thinking or like OP or something, they would have like, you wouldn't have ever even been on a skateboard or like a surfboard or anything, but you'd wear these like surf shirts and stuff. Yes. Along those lines. <laughs> yeah. I I would have liked to have, um, is, is there a 90, a piece of nineties nostalgia that you'd like to, that you'd like to see or would have liked to have seen already? <sighs> I, I'm surprised there weren't more trapper keepers. I know that 90s, that yeah. was more like of an 80s thing, but I kept that stuff for a really long time. Peachy folders, oh, yeah. trapper keepers, I used those until they fell apart. Um, since Natalie was kind of like a rocker, I know that there was like a Marilyn Manson shirt and she wore a leather jacket, but I remember being just entrenched with like bondage bracelets and like yes. bondage necklaces and stuff like that where you wouldn't know I would wear to gym just like a blue sweatshirt because I never really got down how to dress but I wanted to be goth I wanted to be cool so I would wear like some normal frumpy dumpy outfit with a bondage bracelet and I remember one time some girl mm-hmm. came up to me and was like do you know what that means and I was like yeah it means sodomy like can you imagine <laughs> can you, I said that. that's a real quote that's what I said so awesome. stuff like that or Doc Martens. I don't yeah. think I saw anyone wearing Docs. In, um, in I think Lottie had a pair. Did she? Okay. That yeah. would make sense. Um, you know, it's so funny that you mentioned that because that's actually, it, that was going to be my, what I, that that's the one thing that I would, would have liked to have seen too, is more of that, um, you know, the layering, especially with like black leather jewelry Yeah, and like, yeah lots of necklaces and rings and bracelets and yeah it was all black and it was um it was all black or it was chains or or both and you know it's I I did a lot of that um and like really badly dyed hair no one had yes. any really bad dye jobs I remember oh my god manic panic dyeing my hair black and then bleaching it and then having it go some other color so like after you know so many circulations of that it was just some real muddy brown or like (laughs) gross green with like you know blonde high blonde roots just ridiculous they could have done like some some manic panic scenes for sure what I what I would have loved to have seen the one hairstyle I would have loved to have seen that we didn't see is the shaved the the bob with the shaved head underneath so your hair (laughs) is just kind of floating above yeah I had that at one point because I have really thick hair I did too still see I'm uptight with my hair I've always tried to make it small small smaller than it was so I would shave underneath and then because I had thick curly hair my hair would literally just float over (laughs) because there was nothing to keep it down good look oh that's so funny (laughs) and where are all of the earrings I mean people just like people's entire ears were covered back then and eyebrow piercings oh yeah yeah (laughs) they they yeah the 90s of yellow jackets is kind of like the look of the really early, like the innocent years of the nineties before it got, cause nineties could be a little bit dark, like late nineties were a little bit dark. So they were keeping it kind of clean here. There were no eyebrow piercings or anything like that. Yeah. True. Yeah. Kind of a bummer. <laughs> um, what's a, uh, I know, and, and I know we, we, uh, I know you've got to wrap it up here. So, um, just real quick, what are uh, I? I'm so grateful that you've contributed to um, the Antler Queens uh, Yellow Jackets playlists. Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't um, know if you. I was happy to jump on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw your contributions. I was really excited about that. <laughs> um, what are some? Uh, what are some? Just name a couple of songs that you would really love to hear in the show from the '90s. Definitely Nine Inch Nails needs to come in mm-hmm. at some point. I don't think that they made it into season one. Um, Seether, Ruka Salt, Seether. Yes. That would be, I could just like the beginning of that song going into like, like the first shot of a scene would definitely fit. Um, who else? The Breeders. Um, mm-hmm. And I think at some point this wouldn't cut in with the timeline, although it would present day. Juliet and the Licks. She's got to yes. be on the soundtrack at some point because... 
I, I have not talked nearly enough about Juliette Lewis um, or Melanie Linsky, really, because of my uh, misty favoritism. But Juliette Lewis is just like a god to me. Yeah. She is so cool. And just having her on this show and seeing what she does with this character, I think this is her best acting that she's ever done. And that's saying Same. a lot because I've been a fan with, of hers for years. But um, her and Melanie Linsky, just the way that they can empower a scene and just really embody these characters, it's the, the word I keep using over and over, but it, it's the only one that fits is masterful. Just what these ladies have done. And I'm so glad that this show has been as well received as it has, because then you have another favorite of mine, A League of Their Own, that, that they're just hanging out there so disrespectfully in the dirt. We don't know ever if that's going to get picked up and makes me want to just riot oh, in the man. streets. But the fact that people are embracing Yellow Jackets, I'm so happy because I want it to go on and on and on for 10 seasons. Same. Yeah, it's it's my it's already my favorite show of all time. Yeah, totally. Um, well, thank you so much for um, for joining me. And I hope you keep contributing to our, our playlists because I will. I, yeah. I, uh, we have a lot of the same musical taste, so I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of excited about that. Um, but yeah, it was an absolute pleasure having you on. Thanks for having um, me. It was so much fun. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel like we would have hung out if we were in high school together. Totally. 100%. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, everybody make sure you check out, uh, Kelly's work. You can, um, find her at her website down there below kellymcclurewritestuff.com um, and you can find an article of her uh, especially all of her Yellow Jackets articles especially um, I mean she's written so much awesome stuff about the show and about other topics uh, you can go to vulture.com slash author slash kelly dash McClure um, and find a whole list of her articles that I'm sure you'll love reading as much as I did um, Thanks so much for joining. I, I hope that we can get you back here one day. Yeah, I'd love to be yeah. back. Thanks so much. Awesome. It was fun. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to sign off for now. Um, peace, love, and yellow jackets, everyone. Buzz off. Bye.